Welcome back to Missing. I am Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing great today, Tim. Actually, I'm doing fantastic because I love it when we have guests on who have been on previously and they just always bring such great conversation to the table. And this one's a fan favorite, I think. I think a lot of people really love this gentleman. But Tim, before we get to that, you know what I'd love? I'd love to hear how you are. <laughs> I am doing great over here. And yeah, I'm really excited to speak with David Perlmutter again. He is a professor and dean at Texas Tech University College of Media and Communication. And he is great to speak with. He's funny and he brings out topics that we don't typically think of, like th things that we talk about and do without consciously really thinking too much. And he kind of gives us pause because he, he gives us these thoughts that, um, you know, we, we have to consider. And so these conversations with David Perlmutter are really great. It's a really good point. I feel like David checks in with us periodically throughout the year and we have these conversations, even if they're not recorded conversations. We'll have emails about current events that are happening and how the media is treating them, especially in the world of true crime. And he's the expert on it. So these reoccurring conversations that we do have on air are essentially a combination of all of the ones that we've had leading up to it in email form until we're finally like, oh, we should get on and talk about this because now it's sounding like important to talk about for the listeners. Right. And in this conversation, we speak about the disappearance of Tara Calico a bit. And uh, she went missing from New Mexico in 1988. And there was some recent articles in the media about this case and about how there could be charges coming. So that is really the uh, sort of the launch point for this conversation. And if anybody does have information on the disappearance of Tara Calico, please contact the Valencia County Sheriff's Office. And if you want to hear episodes of Missing early and ad-free, as well as our weekly bonus show, you can subscribe to Missing Premium on Apple Podcasts. And if you're not an Apple user, don't worry. You can go to missing.supportingcast.fm and find the same product there. There's a bundle, Lance, with Missing, Crawl Space, and our new podcast called Dark Valley, which you can hear early episodes of in this bundle. So make sure to check it out. And Tim, Dark Valley was recently featured on Apple Podcasts up at the browse section. So if you don't know where you can find Dark Valley and you're on your Apple Podcast app, just scroll a little bit right there at the top. You'll see Dark Valley and you can sign up on that Apple subscription or you can listen to new episodes every Friday. All right, everyone. Thanks a lot for listening. We're going to break quick for commercial here and we'll be right back with Professor and Dean David Perlmutter. Welcome back to the podcast, Dean Perlmutter. How are you today? Thank you. Very happy to be here. It's great to have you here. I was going to personally go with uh, his lordship or his, <laughs> his highness, but I think Dean's okay. Um, I feel like this is something that you've been angling for for a while uh, to get this assignment of like the supervillain, this Dean supervillain. I've been watching Succession. Oh, okay. That makes sense. And I'm I'm interested in how these people have a lot of power, but they insist on being called by their first name. And it's sort of disarming. Like you, you, the president of the United States is Bob or something like that. And I, I think that sometimes people in power will have this false closeness and intimacy that puts you off guard. Uh, I, I, I certainly, if I ever, not that Charles III would ever call me. Never say never. But- I wouldn't, hey, Chuck, thank you. I appreciate Even if he said, <laughs> call me Chuck, I would not call him Chuck. So just Dave is fine. Dave, okay. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> um, well, uh, let's see. This is now, I think, your third uh, your third interview um, on, on this uh, podcast. Can you um, tell us a little bit, refresh our listeners' uh, memories? Who are you and uh, what is it that you do? Well, no one can know who I really am. <laughs> but um, my profession is that I'm a journalism professor, and I also am dean of the College of Media Communication at Texas Tech University, where we teach everything from podcasting to public relations and advertising and now gaming and AI analytics and robotics and the, the massively expanded world of media and communication. 
And we very much appreciate uh, the work that you do because we have a, a not insignificant number of students who are very interested in audio and audio production and all the different aspects of it, including on air, but also production and technology and, and booking, every, everything that you do, probably do for yourselves. Uh, but uh, some, some, as some of the broadcasts, you know, have different people. I, I, I'm, I'm very interested now. And when I'm listening to audio books, I'm hearing four or five people like so-and-so was executive producer. So-and-so was sound technician and the, the high end audio books from, I guess, bestsellers or big book companies, they have a, a, an entire staff of people just working on the, the production of one book besides the person who's reading it. It's crazy. I was going to ask another question, but you brought up the audio book topic and Tim and I are both listening to I just finished I think Tim is close to it yeah, I just James it. Renner just released his latest book Little Crazy Children and it's excellent and he reads it but he told us he read it in a small studio in uh, Columbus Ohio and it was just like a basic like small studio no no big production staff but it sounds outstanding like and then you you hear the other ones of these productions with like multi narrators and a, a producer, an audio engineer, a you know a director. I can't tell the difference. I wouldn't be able to tell you if James Renner had like a team or not behind him. Yeah, the the technology has really gotten very good, hasn't it? Uh, for people, the entry level is much lower than it certainly was when I was growing up. You needed it. You literally needed a radio station to record an interview and an entire building worth of, of technology. I know. And now we've all got these home setups that sound great. And as long as there's not a dog barking in the neighborhood, you know, it's, it's great. Just as you said, it sounds great. You cut out there. Exactly. So I... as, as long as the internet doesn't cut out. So how long have you been doing this? I've been a professor now for 30 years. I've been here at Texas Tech for 10 years. And I've been interested in the crime genre and police and, and law enforcement for about 20 years because I, I wrote this book based upon my writing along with the police department and seeing the interactions with the public and, and then relating it to the world of media, which is my original reach out to you about talking about journalism and fictional or semi-fictional coverage of crime and law enforcement. The book was called Policing the Media, and I, I've just always been interested. Re last year, talked to the Texas Sheriff's Association on this very topic, mentioned you all as a great podcast, Sheriff, these sheriffs. By the way, it was the first time I ever spoke to an audience where everybody was open carry, 250 people armed. So it was a really respond, good group to, to uh, work with. Uh, that doesn't happen in Texas very often, even though that may be your stereotype from outside of, of, of Texas. But but they were actually very interested in true crime because they were having more and more interactions with the public where people were coming to them or people who are victims of crime or relatives of victims or people who are interested in police work or the, the city council. And they were coming to them with uh, information that they'd gotten from a true crime podcast. So that's a, a fascinating sort of loop back phenomena of police work now is reacting to you. While, and the case that I think we'll talk about a little, a little now, the Tara Calico case is probably, a, I think, a good example of that. Yeah. And I was actually curious, you mentioned this development that is the relationship between like what we do and the podcast and law enforcement and the public. In your time as a professor and, and researching this and educating others about this, did it just seem to like accelerate like zero to 60? Like it wasn't happening and then all of a sudden it was happening. And how did you keep up with it if it did accelerate that quickly? Yeah, you could say that there were different eras, like there's geological eras or there's eras of an, an ancient city like Rome where you can identify different civilizations or people who live there. Uh, we have the time, the golden age of radio, 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, and people listen to uh, media about uh, high, highway patrol or the Lone Ranger. I mean, different forms of, of law enforcement. And they were uh, 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 Dragnet, very famous. A lot of the, a lot of the TV shows that we we think were the first 
cops and robbers, detective shows were actually radio shows before they became that. Then we entered the, the golden age of television, the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, where we had more and more cops and robbers, detective, investigational, private detective shows, the, the Columbos, the McClouds, the, the Blue Knights, all, all the, the many, many t- Hill Street Blues. You can name hundreds of them. And and I think last time we talked, we, we mentioned that one of the things that drove me to write my book in the late 90s was that I read this really interesting statistic that cops were the most overrepresented professional category on television. Like there were more police per television citizen than anything else in terms of just the wide world of law enforcement. Again, private detectives and you know, blue, blue coated street officers. And so we think we know so much. We're saturated. And then most recently, we we had we had two things happen. We had the CSI era, where all this amazing technology raised the expectations of juries, of journalists, of the public, of like what evidence you should be, how you should be able to find solve a crime. Like, why don't you just run the DNA and solve the crime and so on. And that has really affected police work. It's affected coverage of, of media. I mean, every time you do a podcast or any true crime podcast, they always talk about the DNA evidence and they talk about like this was found and you know, so on. And then we're now in the next era of crime and law enforcement media. And that's the podcast era, the true crime podcast. And, and it seems like 50, 60 percent of the country and certainly seems like almost everybody you talk to about a crime they didn't read about it in the old fat old sources of like the evening news, unless it was a local crime that happened recently in their area. But most of the time, when you talk to people about where did you get this information about, you know, the, the Pickering eight or the you know, Yuba city five or, or uh, you know, the mysterious disappearance of Tara Calico, a podcast, a true crime podcast. So th- this is your era <laughs> for being the main source of information about crime, law enforcement, detective, everything to do with the world of true crime. Yeah, and it's kind of wild that I think for a lot of the people who are content creators, we didn't expect it to be that sort of powerful vehicle that you're describing it to be. It really gradually happened, at least you know, speaking for Tim and myself. It gradually happened where we were becoming more and more aware that people were listening and, oh, wow, now we have to be really thoughtful about what we're saying in terms of making sure it's accurate. And how do you feel about that? Do you see that this, uh, do you see that maybe there's another wave coming up where more deliberate information is being put out there, more accurate, deliberate information is being put out there? No. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, I, I, I think like anything else, look, I, I, I've always said there, there was no golden age of journalism. There was a golden age of being a journalist. And, People got things wrong in major newspapers and on television in 1975. It's not like inaccuracy was invented in 2017. Uh, what you have, though, as we've talked about, is that now there are, I mean, I, I, I'm, would I be accurate to say there's tens of thousands of, of true crime podcasts out there? I mean, thousands. At least. I think there's two, two or three, two or three. That's right. I mean, in terms of real quality, I, I, yeah. I see your point there, Lance. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but there's a lot out there, right? And then and then if you want to add all the blogs and websites, and then anytime anybody starts a thread on Reddit about a, a, an older case, a cold case, or, or you know mysteries, Reddit mysteries, things like that. So there's a massive amount of information out there. It is not being filtered by the traditional system we had of journalism. I, but as I've said before, that, that I'm not defending that traditional system. It, it just did. It was an actual filter. Right. So, so now we're completely unfiltered. And now rather than having a filter, which was faulty, and I think that's the way that I would put it. That's it, it's up to us to discuss. The re- reason I reached out to you is I felt you guys were very, very good filters. Like you were thinking about and taking responsibility with power comes responsibility. Right. I felt that you all. We're really trying to take responsibility for what you said and did and the and that it might have an actual effect. There are a lot of people who are doing uh, podcasts or posting content, and I'm, I'm worried they're not actually thinking like, hey, these are real people might be affected by this. 
if if you get something out there that's wrong or misleading or sensational, people are crying <laughs> over these cases. I mean, there's the, you know, anytime anybody dies, there's the other victims, right? And you you always bring that up right? every single time. You talk about the other victims, the family, the friends, the the sort of like the whole pool pond that's been affected by the, the rock that dropped in the middle of somebody's life. Yeah, I think we find that very important um, because obviously there's more than just one victim um, in a lot of these cases, um, a murder or missing persons. Yeah, there's it, the reach is is um, kind of incredible sometimes. And you've reached out to people. Uh, you've made yourself very open for families to, uh, or or people who are investigating a case to contact you. And I, I think that's that's also a very good thing. Yeah, we're always happy to uh, speak with family. I think that's a big part of the point of what we're doing. Um, you know, one thing that we tell family members, and we have probably discussed this before with you, but um, you know, I think. I think a television news program doesn't offer the same amount of time that a podcast can, you know, and uh, an interview with a family member is usually 45 minutes to an hour with us. It's so different uh, of an experience for them um, speaking for that long and, you know, a, re a, gen a real genuine back and forth um, as opposed to um, like a news segment, which I'm sure is a back and forth, but it's cut so quickly. It's got to make like a two minute format. Yeah. One of the, aspects of journalism that has been pretty hard hit in the last uh, 30 years has been long form journalism that now they still have shows like Dateline or there'll be an HBO documentary just saw a really good four part documentary. I, th I, I forgot what network it was on about the Spectre murder case in California. Very well done. Um, saw a, a HBO documentary about the Cosby uh, multiple cases. Very well done. So there's still that sort of heavily curated documentary, but they tend to be done, you know, over over months and then they're they're done. And, and, and sometimes there's some reaction. Actually, I've noticed now sometimes they'll do a podcast along with the documentary so they can talk about more recent developments. Uh, that's interesting that the podcast matches the uh, more traditional media product, but uh, you have an unlimited amount of responsiveness. I mean, you can say like, hey, we just found out something new about a show we did two weeks ago. We're going to do another episode because there's something amazing and new that just happened in this last week. Um, television has trouble and it can be three hours long <laughs> if you want it to be right. Right. There's no network guy going, whoa, whoa, whoa stop, you know, commercial, you know, or you know, can't be. Yeah, I, I mean, and we love the um, the sort of complimentary piece, um, whatever, whether that's the docu series or the podcast, um, you know. But I think it's great when there's a docu series or a documentary with um, more information out there than they're able to put into the TV show, and you can dive deeper in the podcast. I feel like that's uh, so valuable because there are so many people who want who want to hear it in a different way or want to um, go deeper into it. Definitely, definitely, and the original. Uh, item, news item that we talked about was that a couple of weeks ago, there was an announcement about the Tara Colico case. And you've done you've done an episode, right? Did you do one? I think maybe the the photograph has has come up on the show, but um, because that's such like a recognizable photo um, from just doing this work. But uh, other than that, I don't think we've ever done an episode on Tara Calico's case. And we're going to take a quick break here. We'll be right back with David Perlmutter and a quick summary of Tara Calico's case before we get too deep into it. And a thank you to our sponsors. Back to the program. Tara Lee Calico was 19 years old when she went missing from Valencia County, New Mexico on September 20th, 1988. She was riding her bike alone on State Road 47 when she and her bicycle vanished. Now, the route she was riding was one she rode every day. So on this day, Tara was supposed to meet her boyfriend at noon to play tennis, but she did not arrive. And after hearing about Tara not arriving for tennis, her mom, Patty, drove the bike route looking for any sign of her. But there was no sign of Tara, and Patty called the police. And police found pieces of Tara's Walkman and a cassette tape, which Patty said Tara likely dropped deliberately in order to leave a clue. 
and there were very few clues that came up in the public realm, and the police theorized that Tara ran away. But then on June 15th, 1989, almost a year after Tara disappeared in New Mexico, a Polaroid photograph was found in a convenience store parking lot in Port St. Joe, Florida, over a thousand miles from New Mexico. And you may have seen this photo. It's very distinctive and disturbing. It shows what appears to be a teenage girl and a young boy with their mouths duct taped and their hands tied behind their backs in a confined space. It's unclear where they are or what the purposes of taking this photograph would be. And this photograph was soon broadcast on America's Most Wanted, and some folks who saw the television program thought that the bound girl could be Tara. In fact, Scotland Yard analyzed the photo and concluded that it was Tara Calico in it. However, the Los Alamos National Lab disagreed, and the FBI's results were inconclusive. And now we're going to play a clip from the June 2023 press conference, and we're going to hear from Valencia County Sheriff Denise Vigil. And big thanks to KOAT ABC in Albuquerque for the audio. Good morning. I want to thank everyone for joining us here today. We are here today to talk about the progress of the Terra Calico case. With very little resources, law enforcement has never given up on finding out what happened to Terra Calico. I personally was not sure I would ever see the day of a significant breakthrough, but here we are today as I stand before you and confident of the findings in this case. Terra's family has suffered long enough Tara's parents are no longer with us, but we do have Tara's remaining family. Two sisters, Michelle Dole and Deb Hammond Dole, two brothers, Chris and Todd Calico, and one brother-in-law, Tom Hammond. The people responsible will soon have to answer to this family and to the community who has never stopped thinking of Tara. We stand behind the family throughout this whole ordeal, and we will never stop standing behind this family. I will move on to my news brief at this point. Tara Calico was a 19-year-old avid cyclist who enjoyed regular rides along New Mexico Highway State, State Road 47 in Valencia County. In September 1988, Tara left to ride her regular bike route and told her family she would be home by lunch. After failing to return home that afternoon, her mother reported her missing. Neither Tara nor her bike were ever located. Tara was loved by her family and her friends, and her loss has left behind grieving family who will continue to search for answers. In the 35 years since Tara's disappearance, the Sheriff's Office has been enlisted has enlisted the assistance of the FBI, and together we have leveraged our collective resources to further this investigation. We know there have been numerous theories about what happened to Tara. To preserve the integrity of the investigation, we cannot reveal all that has been learned. But rest assured, investigators have followed up on all theories, leads, and tips. When we can share case updates or information, we will do so directly to the community through the official channels. At this time, law enforcement believes there is sufficient evidence to submit this inve investigation to the district attorney's office for review of potential charges. Currently, the identities and specifics of the persons of interest are sealed by the court and will remain so until a court order otherwise, otherwise, orders otherwise, sorry. Regardless, community members remain a vital resource and we always will welcome additional information. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the ongoing efforts of the FBI, the Rocky Mountain Information Network, and the 13th Judicial District Attorney's Office, who has assigned their very best in this case in pursuit of justice. Most importantly, I would like to thank the members of the Calico and Dole family for their unwavering support and patience. In the coming months, the Valencia County Sheriff's Office looks forward to working with prosecutors to obtain justice for Tara and her family. Okay, and now back with David Perlmutter. And it is one of those cases that has these multiple points of mystery. It's not just one disappearance and then endless speculation about that one happened. There, There is this, and people can look this up, but, you know, this young lady disappeared. 
And then there was this mysterious photograph. There were some other photographs. Was was she in the picture? Was was this a hoax? Was it unrelated rumors? We talked before about law enforcement sort of struggling on what to release and what not to release. We have cases like the John Benet Ramsey murder where there is disagreement between different law enforcement agencies, even open warfare. <laughs> Uh, as it was cases with the Denver and Boulder police and, and DA's office about who should have charged whom when. In this Tara Colico case, there have been some press releases from the sheriff's office and from some other offices that then nothing happened afterwards or somebody said you shouldn't have done that. So it, it, it's it's another one of these cases that has all these sort of cake layers and you're trying to figure out how are they connected. She has not been seen since. 35 years. So the she she has been declared legally dead, but there has also been cases where uh, one of the sheriffs announced, actually announced, I know who did it. I just don't have enough evidence to charge them. Most recently, which I think prompted us getting together, there was an announcement from the sheriff's office that they feel they have enough evidence. But then I think about a month and a half has gone by and there's been nothing else on this, which is very interesting. Her her town is not, it's in Valencia County, which is not um, like a huge media county. Like, you know, it's not in New York or something. And I, I, I found it a little odd that there wasn't a more media follow-up on somebody announcing this very famous cold case might be solved and then nothing happening. I mean, we've talked about how p- there's police time versus public time versus journalism time. We recently had the murder of those uh, college students up in Idaho, and it shows you how accelerated the world we live in that like we were like three days into it and people were already saying, why haven't the police arrested anybody? Police, especially nowadays, they want to make sure they have an ironclad case before they they charge anybody. They don't want to charge somebody too soon and give away evidence or once lawyers get involved, you know, you have to turn over things. So they were waiting. FBI was involved. They were tracking the, the suspect, the camera and other GPS and so on. So we're wondering what's going to happen here with, with Tara Colico. The other aspect of the case was that not only were there a lot of local rumors, and I think there've been some podcasts. I listened to one podcast of somebody who lived in that town and she also made some accusations. I don't think she actually named the people, but said like, everybody knows and now you've you've had the situation in a couple of the major cases that you started getting. In fact, your first major case, you can talk about that, where you you, you went to the site, right, in, in, in New England, and you would have people tell you, well, everybody knows, right? But then does that mean everybody knows or everybody thinks? They know? Yeah, it definitely doesn't mean that in Maura Murray's case. I think people are all over the map um, still in in Maura Murray's case, um, you know, neighbors and locals included, um, and definitely no offense to anybody up there, um, but there are just a lot of uh, theories that are still uh, rampant. Um, in this case, the press conference seemed curious to me because the sheriff said people responsible, and that was um, that was from the the recent press conference on. I think it was on June 13th, 2023. And that would match what this Sheriff Rene Rivera said back in 2008, that um, they had two men as suspects who were teenagers at the time of the disappearance. Um, but he th- that was the comment that you referenced earlier, that um, this the sheriff made, made a comment that they knew. Um, so maybe that is um, the truth in this case. Um, however, I have to wonder what the point of the press conference was at all because i i wrote down another quote um from the sheriff and uh she said law enforcement believes there is sufficient evidence to submit this investigation to the da's office for review of potential charges they're not really saying anything with that like and that and that was like the most hard-hitting thing that they said but i will say they seem very confident all the people who spoke and there was someone from the rocky mountain information information network which you know, it was kind of like a, almost like a corporate, uh, like couple minutes of a, uh, paragraph or whatever he said, like, but everyone seemed very confident that something was going to happen, I would say, but the press conference was a little bizarre in my opinion. Yeah. I, I can't say that, but, um, 
at least in my opinion, I can't say that, but there were aspects there, which I, I was asking myself, first of all, who's everyone, right? Like was the DA's office represented and did a representative of the DA's office stand up and say, we have enough evidence to charge somebody or were they only law enforcement officers? Because then you get into the fact that there are often disagreements, very famous ones like the John Bonet case we talked about before, where typically this is, I don't know if it's the case here, but the stereotype is police are more likely to say, hey, we've got them, we've got them, let's charge. And the DA might be more reluctant, like, mm, I don't think it's a, it's 100 percent. I'm not sure I can take this to court. And there have been cases in the past where the police have held a press conference to put pressure on the DA's off on, and the other way around. I don't know if that's the case here, but. I would like to know what was the was there an official position by the the DA's office in that county and I don't think I heard that. What was it about her disappearance that has resonated through 3 decades? Well, I'm I'm reconstructing because I don't think I heard about this case until the photograph and and I don't know if you have the ability to do that but but you know I think it's public domain it certainly appears everywhere. There's a famous photograph that was found under very odd circumstances, but in the photograph, and I'm just reading, I'm looking at the photograph right now as we're talking about, there are two young people, one obviously a young woman uh, that I'm guessing is in her late teens, and one a much younger boy who look like they're bound and gagged in the back of what looks like a van. And I personally did not hear about the case until that photograph, the Polaroid picture, People may, may or may not remember Polaroid technology before Polaroid that that was released. So that was an interesting instance of the crime, I don't think, was a national story. It was the photograph that made it a, a retroactive national story. And that that has been analyzed. I mean, it, again, if you look at the, 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 the history of it, it, one lab said, yes, that is her in the picture. The mother, I think, is on record saying, I think it's her. Another lab said no. And then the, I think the FBI lab said, we don't know. So so the whole mystery of the picture. And then there were some other pictures that arose as well. But like that's an interesting case where, where a piece of media, to some extent, became more famous than the case itself of the original disappearance, which happened in a, in an area which it, it, it wasn't downtown Albuquerque and it, it wasn't downtown Los Angeles. It wasn't a big boulder or, or someplace where you, there's a lot of media hanging out waiting for a big news story. Yeah. Yeah, really interesting stuff. Um, yeah, and uh, so Scotland Yard is the, the group who analyzed the photo and concluded that it was um, Tarek Halico. Um, the Los Alamos National Lab disagreed, and the FBI were uh, were inconclusive. The mom thought w- was apparently um, thinking that the the initial photo was Tara, um, and then the other two photos you mentioned. I guess one, the mom is insistent that or was insistent that it was not Tara, and then one I think she thought could have been. And if this is a hoax, I mean, first of all. Anybody who does a hoax on people's hopes for the, their daughter being alive, that's, that's, that's a terrible thing to have done something like this. But it is mentioned in that, that in the picture is a book that's visible that the mother said was a book that her daughter, uh, the author, a mystery author, actually a horror mystery author, her daughter loved. So there's, there's this other connection besides just, happens to look like somebody there and then right. there's there a small did. boy in the picture too which there's a lot of backstory on that too yeah um tara's mom thought that there was a a mark on on her leg that was uh familiar familiar as well um so that was one another reason why she thought it was definitely tara now they apparently broadcast the photo on america's most wanted i guess back in 1989 which led to um uh, Tara's family sort of was talking about it. And it led to um, the family of a missing boy to uh, believe that the boy in the photo was um, their their boy, Michael Henley. 
Um, but it apparently was not because he was found um, not long after that near where he went missing. But the photo is definitely interesting and they couldn't rule it out. Um, and it was definitely taken past the point where Tara went missing um, based on, I guess, Polaroid stock or, or uh, something like that. Yeah. And it's in 1989. Interesting year because that's when the commercial internet technically began. As you know, the internet was a, a military and higher education resource, but became the thing, the internet with web addresses, 1989. And so it was just at the cusp of the era that we're in now where something like that would be accessible. And of course, America's Most Wanted was probably the most popular true crime show of its era. A uh, very famous show broke a lot of cases because of the national attention that it gave there. So I don't think they did something on Tara. Somebody correct me before the the picture came out. So again, it, it, it the picture has become more famous than the circumstances of her original disappearance. And we're going to see. I actually when, when I contacted you about this and I said, "Wow, this is so sensational about a 35-year-old case that they have a break on." And then it took us a couple of weeks to get together and I'm going like, "Well, I was sort of expecting something to happen. I was expecting an arrest or or like big news on on DNA evidence or something like that." Uh, but uh, we've had it's either a sign of our impatience or a sign that maybe something is it, still needs to happen before an arrest is made. Well, I don't know if it's so much a sign of our impatience because we wait so long to get this information from people and, you know, from like law enforcement. And when you get the press conference, I remember when they did the press conference about Maura Murray only to come out and say, we didn't find anything. And everybody was like, well, why did you even do this then? And it was, I guess, sort of them responding to the public pressure that they needed to do something there. But when you say that you have a development I mean, you almost expect that's going to be followed up in the next couple of days, it, maybe. And I don't know, maybe that is being a little bit impatient with it, but to have nothing for so for a couple of weeks is suspicious. And it makes me wonder if this might have been a tactic. Do you think that this might have been a tactic to uh, cause someone to mess up, to screw up and say something? If they thought that the pressure was on with a press release, like a, a another public announcement. Well, you you've covered the Maura Murray case, obviously. Uh, very. In, in, uh, how many podcasts did you do on on that one case? In seven hundred. Uh, yeah, yeah, about one hundred fifty or something, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, and and you know that while a lot of people claim to know something, we know somebody must know something. I mean, there there was the one scenario of her running off in the woods, and I guess, I, I guess then nobody except her knew what happened, and she passed away in exposure in the woods. That's one scenario of what happened to her, and then and then there would be no. There was the people who saw her in the road, and the the, the family who saw her from across the road, and things like that. So there there may be some more people who know something, but there wasn't like an a actual knowledge of what finally happened to her. Uh, with this one. There's no possibility there aren't multiple people who, who know, don't know anything. I mean, there must be. I don't believe people keep secrets this well. <laughs> this is this is why I'm not a, a, a conspiracy theorist in the big sense. You know, like like 10,000 people at NASA all agreed to, and, and the Russian government, you know, agreed to keep secret that we didn't land on the moon or something like that. <laughs> people are very bad at keeping secrets. Um Unless unless something pretty high is at stake or the threat is pretty high. So, yeah, that's one scenario is that police are frustrated and they say, you know, we're just at the edge here and we want to push to crack somebody to, to, to talk or something like like that. Um, it was an unusual way to do that, though, I, I have to say. I mean, we'll, we'll find out. I mean, if nothing happens for a couple of years, then I guess you both are right that this was a tactic. If something happens next week, maybe not. Right. No, I think uh, I think that's a good read. I think this could be um, 
this could be the the police department sort of um, paving the way for uh, some public um, uproar if the DA doesn't, you know, decides not to charge it. Because, again, that was the only thing they said is that we're handing over this information to the DA's office for review of potential charges. Like, that's that's like not anything. <laughs> I mean, they should be doing that anyway. They do that every day on other cases, like without doing a press conference about it. So I think if there aren't charges, though, then people would be like, hey, wait a second. Second, we're, you know, wasn't there a big thing just uh, back in June and nothing? So then, then the pressure would go from the PD to the DA's office, and maybe that's what the PD wants. Well, you bring up the whole question of, of what the police do with a cold case. Um, in the Murray case, I think the impression I got from what I've read and from listening to you and listening to all the episodes of your show was that the local police think the case is solved and are, at least the the police that are there now and were at the time, are not real happy to be continuously investigating a case that they think is already done. Like, it's over. Uh, And that happens sometimes. Sometimes police are like, look, we've got other, we've got more recent murders, we've got more recent things to do, we're limited staff, we can't just reinvestigate this case every every year. And that's why these cases fall cold. I mean, the actual term is referring to something that nobody feels there's anything new on. And so like how, how much how many police resources do you want to commit to a 35 year old mystery versus a what happened last week? Right. So sometimes that's the case. The police are just tired of it and like don't want to hear another podcast. They don't want any public pressure. They, they just want the, everybody to go away and forget about it, right? So then there are these other co- cases, and maybe this is one where parts of the law enforcement establishment are like, hey, you know, we want to keep this hot. And maybe other parts are, no, no, it stays cold. It's, I mean, it, 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 there's, a, there's an old saying in law enforcement, the case is cold until it's burning hot. I mean, until, (laughs) until somebody's actually prosecuted, you could argue every case is cold (laughs) because you haven't made that last little bit of evidence where the police department, the DA's office, everybody in the whole chain of evidence and, and prosecution, you know, we watch those episodes of law and order where they talk about the two, the, the people who investigate the crimes and the people who prosecute the crimes. Until everybody's in sync, then you don't actually have a hot case that's going to court. But there are some cases which are colder than others. And this was this was probably, you could argue, the coldest case ever. And so that's why I was surprised. I I thought this would be this would be a never solved or somebody on their deathbed confesses and then you never know type of case. But isn't that part of the gig, though, with what you said about law enforcement when they will say, I don't want anybody to talk about this anymore. It's, it's cold. Isn't that part of the gig? Like, I mean, isn't that part of what you do as law enforcement to like, you can't just say I'm sick of this. Right. Can you, and I mean, if that's the problem, then that's a huge problem. Yeah. Um, and I'm not, I'm trying in these situations. I, I don't feel that I'm trying to defend any particular law enforcement department or law enforcement in general, I just, in my own personal observations, like when I did this book and I was, I was watching a police department that I believe had about 45 officers. I think that they're busy and they really are like, like when I was sitting in the police car for just one of the three shifts, there was some downtime, but there was just stuff going on all the time. And then getting, getting to know the, officers and detectives they they my my cell phone has a a cat's meow sorry that was your phone <laughs> have that cat come here to be my super villain cat yeah but but the the detectives are are busy just doing the case from a month ago and then you see some of these smaller departments like when we uh, one of our professors here and I mentioned spoke to the Texas Sheriff's Association. There's a lot of counties in Texas and there's counties where there's 2000 people and then there's Houston County. Right. So there's a lot of di- differences in the, in the jurisdiction in terms of what happens in an average month. But as you can imagine, the Houston County Sheriff's Department is gigantic. And the county that only has 3000 people is a relatively small department with just a couple of people. 
And so I, I I am in sympathy when police say, gosh, you know, we're, we're busy with what happened last month. We don't have like a cold case unit. And actually that's not really common. It, you, to some extent, you podcasters, I think have met and, and to some extent Dateline and some other things have met, created the cold case unit. That was not a norm in police departments. If you look at history of police work, they did not have cold case units in the 1960s. A case was just dead. And maybe some officer one day said, hey, I, I think I'll go look at those old files or something like that. But now it's pretty common to hear about, especially states at the state level or large cities to have a cold case unit. So I, I'm not going to defend any individual police department, but it is a problem to, to try to, th- to solve a 35-year-old case. In fact, Probably that's why it's a 35 year old case, because it isn't it isn't easy to solve with every, you know, you can't just pull out a file or we talked about the CSI effect. We have been solving cases with rerunning through the new DNA. I, you've covered this about how D, the DNA evidence system is getting better and better and better. And like we're solving these 50 year old cases. Right. And arresting people. The investment, the local level for that is not very great. Right. And the solve rate has actually dropped even with um, DNA yeah. coming into play. And you mentioned the CSI effect. I think um, prosecutors would argue that it's harder now to get a conviction on cases that don't have DNA than ever before because a jury wants DNA. They want it to be a sure thing. Yes, absolutely. If anybody wants a case of strong media effects, you look at a jury today trying a murder case, they, their standards are simply much higher than the jury of 40 years ago of what they expect. Uh, they expect the science. And that's reasonable. I mean, there is new science and the, the science should live up to what we're, we're asking of it. But on the other hand, boy, you, you wouldn't have gotten a conviction <laughs> long ago if that we, if we demanded every murder case to have that level of uh, forensic uh, detail. And also, as has been noted many times, those shows oversell the science. I mean, this whole thing of like, let's blow up the picture, you know, let's take one pixel and make it the size of uh, Yankee Stadium so that we can see <laughs> the eye color of... And it's clear uh, as day. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. We're going to segue now to the submarine, <laughs> Titanic submarine story. <laughs> I thought something that came out of there was something very interesting was that, as you may have heard, very early on, apparently, the U.S. military heard an implosion at at the right place at about the right time of where that submarine was like, like, like an hour or two. I don't remember the exact details. Right. So the whole three day, four day story of like, they have 96 hours of air. They have 72 hours of air. Probably wasn't a story. They were probably dead long into that story. But you have to think of like the U S military, do they want to tell everybody about the, capabilities of their sound detection technology, right? There's reasons not to share. And the same thing with satellite technology is I wonder sometimes, like, you know, I, I've had this running joke with, with police I know here is that like there's a crime and, and the bank camera didn't capture the crook running to the parking lot, but like, should you call the NSA and they'll just have the satellite <laughs> that has, you know, five billion megapixels to, to, to catch a local bank robber, right? So the technology is getting there, but but down to the local jury in rural counties in, in New Mexico, I'm not sure that everything is available. So cold cases, I think, do create all of these problems. And for journalism, it also creates a problem because how often do you want to report the same story, right? Uh, if there's no new evidence... Podcasters have gone back now and cases which were forgotten about. I mean, I'm old enough to remember a, a case being big, say, 20, 30 years ago, and then it just sort of dropped off. And then somebody does a podcast on it, and then suddenly everybody's talking about the, the case again. So 
you guys are probably create some pressure too, that cases that had really gone cold and really gone cold media wise. Because when we say cold case, we, we're referring to the police, but then there's the, the media. Are the media hot and the, the police cold? Are the DA's office cold and the media are hot? You know, there's, there's all these different groups now, these constituencies. The family are almost always hot. They're all, the family are almost always wanting answers. I've never heard of a case where the, the family doesn't want any answers. I mean, there have been cases where individual family members say, look, I, 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 my hopes have been gotten uh, uh, up so many times I can't take it anymore. I've had people tell me that. And you've, you've interviewed people who've said that before. Like, I, I, I can't take it emotionally anymore to get my hopes up that there's going to be a solution. But generally, the family does want answers. It's the other constituencies that may go cold. Yeah. Okay. I had a question that I really wanted to run by you, and this is a perfect opportunity because you bring up the families. And I'm wondering, in your opinion, where's the line when information that's acquired legally responsibly by a licensed private investigator, if that information doesn't reflect well on the family, but significantly changes any theorized outcome that the family supports? What's the responsibility line there for somebody who has that information and should they disclose that information to the public, which could potentially save a lot of time and resources if it is accurate? And I'll go back and say this has to be information that has been obtained through a accredited an accredited licensed private investigator some or law enforcement, somebody who has given their authority that this is the way the information should be disseminated. Yeah, I sort of I, I understand your 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 question, although it's quite possible. And in, in in fact, we may be talking about this with the Tara Calico case that evidence is in the hands of somebody who who just happens to know something, right? And, and they're not they, they didn't investigate; they just happen to have heard at a bar like a guy say, "Yeah, I did it twenty years ago." And we we've ha- we have evidence from like prison inmates who will say that the person that we were in the cell with com- confessed to a crime uh, and so on. So there's a lot of places we can get evidence. Uh, I'm, I'm not a, a law professor, so I don't know the exact details of what you're required to do. I know uh, if you are in the law enforcement system, you are incumbent not to, not to withhold anything, right? Uh, from being in the evidence pool, maybe not holding a press conference, but being in the evidence pool. But how many times have we heard in a particular case that somebody did hear something or saw something or even has something, but was afraid to come forward or for their own personal reasons, didn't, didn't want to come. They were doing something illegal in the park that day. And that's why they didn't want to come, come forward. So Police are very frustrated about about that. They're, 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 we saw in that my we were watching some television that night. Have you did you watch ever watch that show Longmire? It's based upon a, a detective series set yeah, in the world. Yeah, uh, I, I think I watched Mike. like the first the first season of it. It got a little dry for me. Yeah, yeah, but it was it was a good example. You know, a sheriff with like three deputy sheriffs, and he's got this gigantic county. Probably th- doesn't have that many people, but seems to have a murder every week. Uh, but they uh, they really had this issue of, of people knew something about something but didn't want to come forward, which, which I saw in the world of law enforcement was such a huge problem of people not get it, it wasn't somebody participated in the murder and didn't want to come forward, but like they were they were smoking pot in the park that day when they, when somebody screamed and they didn't want to go to jail for, for smoking marijuana. And so they're quiet on a murder case. Now I, I would hope somebody would see like, Hey, you know, do you really not want to come forward on a murder because you're afraid of, <laughs> I don't know what the, want smoking marijuana charges today, but I mean, <laughs> not I mean, at all. nothing if you're, doing, yeah. if you're not even yeah. caught in the act, but, but maybe, maybe yeah. in 1974, <laughs> that was a big deal. Right. So, uh, it, police are very frustrated by that too. I know this is not, I, this is a, a lighter note to the two hour conversation, but you mentioned that show Longmire and you mentioned how they only had a few officers. It's a sheriff and like two officers but they have like a murder a week 
And it's like, if you had that crime rate in your little town, could we get some government help here? Can we can we maybe see why we have so many goddamn murders in this little town? And maybe we can bulk up the, the police department? Maybe help us out a little bit? Why do they have so many murders there? Well, I don't know how many uh, I, I, of those detective series, you know, the, 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 the private the Sherlock Holmes types where it's not an official police detective, but that's an amateur sleuth. There, as you know, there's thousands. You can go to the library and there's thousands of when they're always set in different places with a little atmosphere. And uh, some members in my family read those. And I always get a kick that like it's set in some tiny small town in Quebec with a population of 17. And there's 46 <laughs> books in the series, each one about a murder. And I'm going like, not even Chicago per capita has the murder rate. <laughs> yeah, they would reass- the, the, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police would reassign 100 Mounties to that one small town because everybody apparently is shooting Something's everybody. wrong there. <laughs> yeah, there's something in the, in, in the uh, croissants, definitely. Something in the poutine. <laughs> causing, well, but, 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 but the, the, the issue is uh, the media play this really important role But we just have to do it responsibly because we can't be forcing a case to closure if there's not enough, if there's actually not enough evidence. And I think that's the part that I I appreciate in your podcast and is not just reminding people about the humans involved, the the collateral damage of, of humans, but like you have to go to court and you have to get a conviction. And I think police and the DA's office nowadays are, are, are feeling, as you said, that the bar is very high. And so a lot of this hesitation and sometimes political gaming is media related. And it's not just covering a story, it's being the story itself. And I, and I think with Tara Kalko, the media became part of the story, just like podcasting is now part of the story. I think you're absolutely right about that. Um, can't wait to see where that goes. Yeah, I, I hope they have a breakthrough. I mean, again, this poor family has been on the edge for 35 years. You want them to have something. And to be clear, that picture, that photo has never been identified. Is it possible that the people in that photo that we had mentioned were identified and there's just no reason to make their identification public? I, again, we don't know because if if... A, a DA and a police chief detective said, look, we have a suspect and this would tip that suspect that we, we, we know them. So we're just going to not make a statement, but, but, but the photograph was submitted. I mean, so, so it's not like there's a secret. I mean, unless we're missing something, it's not like the Valencia County Sheriff's department has a secret file. And we, when, when it was submitted to the Los Alamos lab, um, Scotland Yard, and the FBI, well, I mean, that's the big three, right? I can't think of who else I would want to send it to, to be inspected. So, and you got the three different versions. It is, it isn't, and it may be. So that lends us to think that, like, we just, the only way we would find out about that picture is if we the case was, was solved. And you found out, you know, did she survive the initial moment there where she was riding her bike? And again, the story is that she was hit by somebody either intentionally or accidentally and then disappeared which in which case the photograph has nothing to do with her case whatsoever unless it was a purpose of hoax but we'll only find that out when the case is solved if the case is solved 